a lot, you know, and it, it, it says a lot to his commitment. But let me tell you a little bit about him. David, while he was in college, was the national chairman of the Young Americans for Freedom. That was at the University of Wisconsin, a, a very liberal bastion. So, I mean, did you have a lot of friends? But, you know, when you were talking about these conservative values. After graduating college, he was um, he worked with Richard Nixon's campaign, and, and he also ran for office, and he was endorsed by the president, and he later worked as political assistant to Vice President Spiro Agnew, and then in Congress as executive senator, executive assistant to Senator James Buckley, another conservative. He was a regional coordinator for Ronald Reagan, uh, the Ronald Reagan National, uh, for Ronald Reagan, national political director for George H. W. Bush, and and until his election. As NRA president, he was chairman of the American Conservative Union. His professional com accomplishments, besides his professional, uh, accom professional accomplishments, this is a man that I know and respect. He's got a great sense of humor, and it, it became obvious a little while ago, and I couldn't remember the reverend's, the reverend's name, and he sent under his breath to me. That's what notes are for. Um, <laughs> And there's always a little sarcasm there as well, but you can't you can't doubt the veracity of the man. And I I, I I like him. I used to sit next to him at the NRA board meetings before he got elevated to those seats. And I, I want to introduce to you my friend David Keene, and I know you're going to love what he has to say. Thank you, Tom, and thanks for having me here. You know, a lot of people won't. Um, I'm, uh, it was difficult for me to imagine until a few weeks ago that there were chief executives in this country with less regard for the Constitution and the way that policy is supposed to be adopted than those we have in Washington. But New York has proven once again uh, that it can top Washington in terms of the high-handedness of the people that hold some of its public offices. I'm here today to join you in protesting the fact that your governor is willing to sacrifice the Constitution, your rights as citizens, and the prerogatives of his legislature on the altar of his own ambition and on the ego on the ego of Michael Bloomberg of New York City. Because that's what this is all about. A couple of weeks ago, I was, I was meeting with a Democratic governor in the West because a lot of these states are considering different kinds of restrictive gun legislation. And I said, Governor, before we start the meeting, I have to tell you that on my way up here, a number of reporters asked me why I was meeting with you. And he said, what did you tell him? I said, I told him I'm meeting with you because you're not Andrew Cuomo. And that you should take that as a compliment. He looked at me and said, believe me, I do. <laughs> there are a lot of people in this country who remember Andrew Cuomo. He's like a bad penny who keeps turning up. <laughs> remember the fights of the 1990s. Remember the Dianne Feinstein so-called assault weapons ban. What did that all center around? The, among the key players in the Clinton administration who went after our Second Amendment rights in the mid-1990s was HUD Secretary Andrew Cuomo, who during that period profanely called the owners of gun companies around the country, including one uh, whose, whose employees and supporters are wearing t-shirts here today, and threatened to destroy their company if they didn't go along with Bill Clinton's position on firearms ownership in this country. We fought them off in the 90s, we'll fight them off now. We've lost battles before, we'll not lose this war. I'm here today because of you and because of the rights that you that you have under the Constitution of this country and because of the courage and the willingness you've shown to stand up for those rights. I'll tell you something, this is a country that was not founded by the politically obsessed. 
the American people. And one of the reasons for our stability of, as a country is that Americans came here, founded this country, and lived here, not because they wanted to be obsessed with politics, but because they wanted to live free. They wanted to earn a living. They wanted their children to be educated. They wanted to enjoy a free life as free citizens in a free society. But throughout our history, when Americans sense that their rights are threatened from abroad or domestically, they have always been willing to step up to the plate and fight for those rights against any enemy, foreign or domestic. That's why you're here today, and that's why I'm here with you. You know, down in Washington, they say, well, uh, the NRA is simply a special interest. My answer is yes, we are. We represent the American people. We fight for the Constitution. We fight for the Bill of Rights. We fight for the rights of free people everywhere. And for those of us who believe in those rights, and who, unlike some of our political leaders, have not only read the Constitution, know that the Second Amendment doesn't apply simply to squirrel hunting, and understand the importance of the Second Amendment and the Bill of Rights to the nature of the country we live in, we all have a special interest in our future and the kind of country we're going to pass on to our children and grandchildren. That's why we're here, that's why I'm here, and that's why you're here. You know, our strength, our strength does not come from the fact that we are a, quote, special interest or that we represent one small group of folks in our society. We at the NRA, we have, we have, we did have four million members. Pretty soon we'll have five million members, thanks to the... Thanks to the folks that are joining in this battle. Our strength comes from the fact that the members of the NRA and the broader community of Second Amendment believers in this country is not simply made up of Republicans or conservatives or Democrats or liberals or factory owners. It's made up of all Americans, farmers, union workers, and all of the rest, police officers and veterans. And because of that, and because of the fact that we, as believers in the Second Amendment, are willing to do something most people in this country are not willing to do, which is not just to stand up for our rights, but to support those people who stand with us and work to get rid of those in public office who do not. You know, a few minutes ago when I was up here, Tom said, well, Dave's going to have to wait a few minutes because we've got a few senators and assembly people who've got to get back to work who, ought, who, who, who need to speak. I was happy to stand aside because here they're allowed to speak. When they get up there with this governor and the leadership that he's imposed upon them, they don't get to speak. They don't get to do what you elected them to do. And we need to change that. We need to change it here and we need to change it elsewhere. So we're with you. We'll, we'll help you defeat the politicians that would deprive you of your rights. We'll help you, dis we'll help you overcome these statutes in court. We'll do whatever is necessary to make certain that the Second Amendment rights that we have had passed down to us are going to be passed down to future generations. I don't want to, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time talking, but I do want to, I want to close with a, with a little bit of a story. Some years ago, in Moscow, there was a dinner honoring General Kalishnikov on the occasion of his 85th birthday. General Kalishnikov, as you'll recall, was the uh, tank driver who in his spare time in World War II invented the AK-47. And he's one of the few one of the few heroes that Russia has because they had a 70-year period there where it was hard to find one. So they held a banquet honoring the general, and Mr. Putin got up at the conclusion of the banquet to toast him on the occasion of his 85th birthday. General Kalishnikov held up his glass in Mr. Putin's face, looked him in the eye, and said, Mr. President Putin, my dream is a country like the United States, governed by men and women not afraid of an armed citizenry. Think about it. We live in that country. We've lived in that country since our founding. In the rest of the world, people can only dream of the freedoms that